It all started so innocently. My wife and I were shopping on Michigan Avenue. Jane was looking for a new outfit for our upcoming 25th anniversary party. She found a nice dress and two pairs of matching shoes, but couldn't decide which pair to get. So I suggested we stop by Gibson's for a drink and get our sister-in-law's opinion. Jane agreed. After two hours of shopping, she was ready for a drink, and it would be nice to surprise Taylor since we haven't seen her in a while. We assumed that Taylor, our sister-in-law, would be working today since she usually tried to take the Saturday shift. She claimed that Saturday tips are always better. Our son Paul was out of town last week. He has been collecting testimony and information related to a court case he is working on. Paul works for the district attorney's office, and although he was not allowed to go into detail, he hinted that the case was connected to the Russian mafia, and he had spoken with several former members who were in the Federal Witness Protection Program. Jane and I hailed a taxi for the short ride to Rush Street. It was only six blocks, but Jane's legs were giving way. Jane just has to wear four-inch heels when she goes shopping on Michigan Avenue. Something about looking the part. I've been married long enough to know to keep my mouth shut and not point out the lack of logic in her shoe choices. The taxi dropped us off in front of the restaurant. It was midday, so this had to be the slowest time of Taylor's shift. If we're lucky, we'll be able to chat for a few minutes while enjoying cocktails and appetizers. When I opened the restaurant door for Jane, I immediately noticed Taylor at the back of the bar. It's hard to miss her as she's 170 famabies of Scandinavian beauty. Taylor was talking to another waiter, but there was an intimacy in their posture that set off alarm bells in my head, including the fact that Taylor's hand was resting on the waiter's shoulder. The head waiter wasn't at the entrance when we walked in, so we stood there for a full minute. During that minute, I didn't take my eyes off Taylor. I was a little surprised by the way they looked at each other. I looked at Jane to see if she had the same reaction. I asked the head waiter for a table in Taylor's section, and after Taylor walked away, I finally looked away from the other waiter. As she made her way to our table, she put on her charming waitress smile, which disappeared the second she recognized us and was replaced by an expression of shock and concern. Mom, Dad, what a surprise. Taylor's voice was a little tense, and she was clearly trying to bring a smile back to her face. Jane answered her. Taylor, we just stopped by for a drink and to get your opinion on some shoes. We've been shopping for hours and we both need a drink. As usual, for you, Dad. Basil Hayden, in its purest form. And for Mom, Grey Goose Rocks? That would be great. Plus one of those cheese plates, please. There's no rush, Taylor. How did you spend this week while Paul was out of town? I asked. I was very busy and very lonely. I miss Paul and hope he comes home soon. Everything is fine with work. I'm training Carlo, the new waiter. Taylor looked at Carlo as she said this, and much to her disappointment, Carlo winked when he noticed her look. Taylor ran off saying, I'll get you some drinks, and most likely told Carlo to cool off in the presence of her in-laws. Carlo took a quick look at us and headed towards the kitchen. I took advantage of Taylor's absence to ask Jane. Baby, I know I'm a little suspicious of my past, so tell me what you saw there. Mark, you're suspicious for a reason. I saw the same thing as you. And I won't let Taylor break our son's heart. She's a little nervous and seemed a little too comfortable with the new guy. Do you think I should call your Uncle Teddy? Teddy was Jane's uncle who retired from the Chicago Police Department several years ago and worked in security. Jane's family on her father's side, the Summers, were all police officers and on her mother's side, Simoncelli, were involved with the Sicilian Mafia. It made for interesting family gatherings. Yes, why not call my uncle and ask him for a drink? Taylor returned with our drinks and sat with us for a while, since there were only a few other customers. When Carlo came to the table to bring our appetizer, I took the opportunity to introduce myself and chat with him for a bit. It was obvious that Carlo's first language was not English. It took me a couple of questions before I knew he was from Italy. Worked here while attending Loyola. Jane and I finished our drinks and most of the cheese before heading home, where I called Uncle Teddy. The Mark Davis Story You may think I'm paranoid, 
Why do I have such an unpleasant impression of a conversation between two colleagues during a break in the workday? This has to do with how my first marriage ended. Marriage to Paul's biological mother. Her name was Claire. This may still be the case if she is still alive. We haven't spoken in 15 years, not since she showed up at Paul's high school graduation. I married Claire right after college. She was a bartender at the tavern where our group hung out. She was the most beautiful, well-built woman I had ever met, and I started dating her as soon as she showed interest in me. I'm not a bad guy, but I'm sure her attraction to me had more to do with the fact that I was a graduate student in college, and she probably heard about my trust fund. I always had a wad of cash on me and always tipped bartenders, especially good ones, more than the standard rate. Claire agreed to my date, we had sex and she almost gave me a hard time on our first night together and accepted my proposal for the rest of the semester. My parents tried to dissuade me from marrying her, but of course I was much smarter than them. I think it was Mark Twain who said he was surprised how much his own father learned in the seven years between Twain's 18th and 25th birthdays, or something like that. Whoever said it and whatever he said, it applied to me in those years of my life. Luckily, my grandfather was very specific when he set up trust funds for me and my brother. These included no access to funds until our 30th birthday and the requirement of a prenuptial agreement before any marriage. Even without half a million in the trust fund, I was still very wealthy. As long as I got good grades, my parents gave me a great allowance. And thanks to my parents' connections, I had a fantastic job waiting for me to graduate with my MBA. I finished school. Claire signed the prenuptial agreement. I'm pretty sure she was high when she signed it, but the notary didn't seem to notice because the whole time he was trying to look under Claire's blouse and see her bare breasts. We got married in Vegas. My parents had a mild objection. I won't say the whole marriage was terrible. In fact, without causing too much trouble for Jane if she reads this, I'd say the sex was exciting. Even though Claire and I had been having sex since our first date, she gave it her all during that week in Vegas. Claire spent every day topless at the pool, wearing the smallest bikini she could find. In fact, one afternoon she befriended a young flight attendant who lent her a wicked weasel swimsuit she bought in the Caribbean. I was sitting on my lounge chair by the pool when the two of them came down from Beth's room. Claire took off her disguise and I almost choked on my beer. All she was wearing were small panties with a string in the back, but in the front there was a transparent triangle that was barely enough to cover her private part. Will they kick us out of here? I asked. If anyone complains, I'll wear someone else. She answered. No one complained, but Claire and Beth spent that day and the next laughing at all the men who found a reason to pass by in an excited state. In the evening, Claire was no less an exhibitionist. She would wear either her tightest jeans with some risque top, never a bra underneath, or some version of a little black dress that barely covered her ass and breasts. One evening, she came out of the bedroom wearing a red silk dress that was almost obscene, complete with a pair of red heels high enough to make her look straight into my eyes. Where are we going when you're dressed like that? I asked. You'll see. That's all she answered. As we walked through the lobby, I enjoyed seeing the men and a few women turn their heads as Claire walked by. We got into a taxi. Claire handed the taxi driver a note, and we headed off to Vegas at night. We stopped in front of a strip club. Claire got out of the taxi while I paid the taxi driver. He grinned, thanked me for the good tip, and wished me to have fun. Before that night, I had only been to a couple of strip clubs in the Midwest. The girls usually looked somewhere between a five and an eight. Very few of them danced with real enthusiasm and never without at least a thong to hide their assets. Vegas was different. Where did all these beautiful women come from? Of course, I know that some or maybe most of them had improvements, but if so, then the operation was top-notch. Claire smiled broadly at me as I looked up at the stage and saw two completely naked beauties, each swinging from a pole. Like this? she asked. Claire lifted the skirt of her dress to reveal a garter around her upper thigh. From her garter, she pulled out a couple of hundred dollar bills. Tonight I'm giving you a treat. And she treated me the same way. I had three lap dances that night. 
I used all my willpower to keep myself from grabbing each dancer's breast or butt with my hands. Two big bouncers who look like they belong on the defensive line are a strong deterrent. As hot as my lap dances were, I almost climaxed with the lap dance Claire bought for herself. Either the bouncers weren't watching, or they were giving the ladies a little more leeway because Claire was more relaxed with the dancer and was touching her body in caresses. After Claire's private dance, we headed back to the hotel. I wanted to go up to our room immediately, but Claire wanted another drink. We sat in the living room, and Clary tried her best to continue teasing us. What did you like tonight? She whispered it in my ear. You mean Besid is my beautiful wife wearing the tightest dress I've ever seen? Or two naked women twirling on poles with the grace of ballerinas? Or three women trying their best to make me climax while they gave me these lap dances? Or just maybe my favorite thing was watching you get a lap dance and get away with liberties with a stripper? Damn it, Claire. How long are you going to tease me here? I want, uh, no, I have to take you as soon as possible. What I don't understand is, how can you tolerate this? Don't you want sex after all this teasing? Who said I didn't have sex? Claire said this, looking me straight in the eyes. Remember how I went to the toilet while you were doing the third private dance? Didn't you wonder why I was gone for so long? Or did you just like that brunette so much that you didn't miss me? What do you mean by this? I'm saying that my husband was having so much fun with the brunette that he didn't notice his wife was going along enough to get laid in the men's room with that handsome black gentleman who was sitting at the next table. I had a hard time processing Claire's confession. Did she continue to tease me, or did she actually just have sex with another man and cuckold me within four days of our wedding? Oh, poor Mark. Your face tells me that you want it to be a lie, but I can see that you are turned on by the thought of some black guy fucking me. What is this, my love? I answered Claire honestly. If you ever cheat on me, I will divorce you so quickly your head will spin. Now let's go upstairs. If I find evidence of recent sex, this marriage will be over before it even begins. We can get divorced in Vegas almost as easily as we can get married. Claire looked dejected, but didn't argue as I took her hand and practically dragged her towards the elevator and back down the hall to our room. When we entered the room, I pulled off her dress, pushed her onto the bed, and examined Claire. Luckily for Claire, there was no sign of recent sex. I quickly undressed and took her. I needed it. Soon after the first release, I began to make love to my wife. We lay in each other's arms. It was a great night, but I felt like I had one last thing to say before we went to sleep. I'll take the teasing but remember what I said. If I ever catch you cheating, it's over between us. I know it's not the most romantic thing a husband can say to his wife after making love, but Claire needed to know how I felt about adultery. We probably conceived Paul that night, or at least during one of the morning, afternoon, or evening periods of our week in Vegas, because six weeks later, Claire was holding one of those pregnancy test strips in her hand and it was showing positive results. I was excited about having a baby, and Claire seemed happy too. At least she never said a single negative word. We were financially secure with my income. We agreed that Claire could be a stay-at-home mom. Claire's pregnancy went without a hitch. Paul was born in December, and yes, he was definitely my son. Claire wasn't a great mother, but she was a good mother to Paul. One of our biggest disagreements during Claire's final pregnancy was whether Paul would breast feed. Claire steadfastly refused to consider the matter, and at the end of the day, you can't foresee a woman to breast feed her baby. After Paul's second birthday, Claire wanted to get back to work. Her only profession was as a barmaid. As a compromise, I insisted on no snack bars or waiting rooms. She had to find an upscale restaurant to work at. Otherwise, it would be impossible. Claire agreed to my demands, and within three months was hired at one of the best lunch clubs in the city. My mom and Claire's mom watched Paul for a few hours when our work schedules overlapped. I thought we had a good marriage. I really loved Claire and thought she felt the same. Once Claire started working, there were no obvious signs of problems. We started spending less time together, but I thought it was temporary until Claire got pregnant again. Unfortunately, there was a snake hiding in the grass, and its name was Neil. 
Claire and Neil worked together in a restaurant. I met him a couple of times while sitting at a bar, which I did sometimes just to spend a few extra hours with my wife. I had never seen anything alarming between them, so that fateful day when I entered our house was a surprise for me. The house was spotless and the kitchen was filled with the aroma of my favorite dish. I kissed Claire and high-fived Paul. What did I do to deserve this? I asked. Claire's response was like a punch to my chest. Mark, it's not easy to say, but I'm leaving tonight with Neil. We're going to California. Neil has a role in a TV series, and he wants me to be there with him. I can't say for sure, but I think I just sat there for a few minutes, looking back and forth between Claire and Paul. I finally shook the cobwebs off my head. You won't take Paul. God, no. Paul stays with you. He's better here with you and our parents. There's no way I can take care of him while I work there. And Neil has no interest in being a parent. I couldn't stand it and started screaming. You're a fucking bitch. You're a fucking slut. How can you do this to us? How can you leave me and your son? What the hell did I do to deserve this shit? You didn't do anything, Mark. But when Neil and I had sex for the first time, I knew it was over between us. You always said you'd divorce my ass if I ever cheated on you. And after Neil took me the first time, I knew it would happen again and again. At that moment, I realized that our almost three-year-old son had been exposed to the most obscene language coming from the mouths of his parents. Paul sat at the table with a frightened expression on his face. I picked him up and sat him in front of the TV. She turned on a Disney movie with loud volume, kissed the top of his head, and returned to the kitchen. Claire didn't move. What's so magical about that asshole's equipment that you have to leave your family? Don't ask, Mark. You're better off not knowing. I controlled myself enough not to scream. No, I really want to know. You never seemed disappointed in our lovemaking. You never complained. What is his secret method of kidnapping wives from their husbands? Turns out I shouldn't have asked because her answer gave me visions months later. Mark, you're pretty big down there, but Neil is a monster, and I'm starting to like it. And that's all? Are you leaving us for giant equipment? Mark, this won't lead to anything. I withdrew half the money from our accounts and had two bags packed in my car. I won't need my winter clothes in Los Angeles, so just donate them to charity. I'll let you know where I land in Los Angeles, but you still have my cell number in case of an emergency. I was still in shock. She walked into the TV room, hugged Paul, kissed him, and just walked out the door. The next day, I woke up my foggy brain and began separating our lives. Canceled credit cards, closed joint accounts, and contacted a lawyer to begin divorce proceedings. All the usual nonsense. Claire was in Los Angeles with Neil. Months later, my recovery slowed a bit when I saw this asshole while surfing the channel one evening. I was wondering how Claire took the fact that Neil's character was in bed with some beautiful actress and they were simulating sex. I didn't deal with it well at all. I stopped watching the channel because, well, because two people were in bed together and I hadn't had sex in months. Then I realized that Neil was a man in bed and to top it all off, he was in bed with some blonde actress who might have been Claire's twin. Talk about bad timing. I turned off the TV, poured three fingers of bourbon, and sent my thoughts of bad karma west to Los Angeles. I also enrolled Paul in daycare, which he could attend during my working hours. Claire's mom offered to look after Paul for free, but I was so furious at the time that I refused out of spite. I allowed her parents to take Paul out on day trips on the weekends, but I never allowed him to stay overnight. You can call me petty, but they raised Claire and I somehow reconciled my actions based on betraying Claire. My mom and dad didn't come straight out and say, I told you so, but they took a perverse pleasure in what happened next. It appears that dad, in the interest of protecting his grandson, has taken it upon himself to hire a private detective in Los Angeles to follow Claire and Neil. That's when we learned they were using cocaine with some regularity. He also documented their sex parties. I think Claire didn't mind sharing, and apparently Nail didn't care either. A private detective made sure the couple was arrested for drugs. It was only a minor misdemeanor, 
but the conviction and the photos from the sex party would be enough to paint Clary as an unfit mother if she ever changed her mind and tried to win Paul back. It was at Paul's kindergarten that I met my second wife, Jane. Jane was a teacher at school and took a special interest in Paul. As might be expected, Paul had difficulty adjusting to the divorce and near-total separation from his mother. Jane's patience and guidance helped Paul overcome his emotional reaction to her leaving. I gradually got to know Jane during our weekly half-hour conference to discuss Paul's progress. Naturally, as the weeks passed, Jane and I eventually started talking about ourselves. Jane began asking me questions to gauge how I responded to Paul's problems. One afternoon, I switched roles and simply asked, What about you, Miss Summers? What attracts you? Jane briefly told me what happened. As a teenager, she developed a tumor that required surgery and left her unable to have a child. After graduating from high school, she seriously considered becoming a nun and was actually a novice for six months before returning home to attend college with the goal of becoming an elementary school teacher. Halfway through her freshman year, she changed her mind and focused her attention on early childhood education and has worked at the school for the past six years. I decided to go all in. What about your personal life? Were there any serious guys? Jane looked at me and said nothing, as if she was wondering how to respond to my intrusion into her privacy. Oh, I thought to myself, that's where she tells me she's a lesbian or just doesn't like men. But instead, Jane smiled. I dated, but never entered into any long-term serious relationship. There was this guy in college, but he really wanted to have kids, and that became the focus of the relationship. I was inspired. Could you please allow me to invite you to dinner sometime? It would be a pleasure to get to know you better and thank you for all you have done for Paul. Seeing Paul smile and laugh is all the reward I need. But if you want to have dinner together, then the answer is yes. That Friday night dinner marked the beginning of a beautiful friendship that blossomed into a beautiful romance. Paul loved Jane. My parents loved Jane. I loved Jane. But most of all, Jane loved Paul and me. We got married within a year. Perhaps someday I will write more about our courtship and marriage, but if I do, it will be found in the romance section. Over the next few years, we heard less and less about Claire, and I finally asked Claire if Jane could adopt Paul. I flew to Los Angeles with the documents to discuss this face-to-face. -face. It was the first time we'd really talked since the night she left, and I took the opportunity to get some answers. Tell me why, Claire. I can't believe you left for the reason you gave that night. No, and I'm sorry that I hurt you so much. We got married too young, Mark. At least I was too young. You know, I was crazy when we met, and I thought our love would change me. But it didn't. And then I had a baby while I'm still struggling with the whole forever thing. It was all too much. I thought work would help me get out and be with adults. But Neil showed up and I screwed up by letting him splurge. I didn't say a word while Claire spoke, but she could see the pain in my eyes. You really shouldn't be sad, Mark. You and Paul will be better off without me, and much better off with Jane in your life. Claire and I spent another half hour talking. She signed the release to adopt Paul, and I kissed her goodbye. To this day, I still cannot understand how a mother can let her child go. I think drugs had a lot to do with her downward spiral. However, we were all shocked by the level of her decline when Claire showed up at Paul's high school graduation. Neil was long gone by then. Claire was accompanied by a guy who made Iggy Pop look good. Claire was a skeleton of her former self. I felt sorry for Paul and especially for Claire's parents. How sad it is to see your daughter wasting away. Once again, Jane's love and attention helped Paul survive this nightmare. I must admit that there were times when I asked God why he would not allow a woman like Jane to have children of her own. Whether God answered me or not, I came to understand that Jane not only raised Paul to be the wonderful young man he is today, but that hundreds of children benefited from Mrs. Davis's preschool classes, Ted Summers and Vincent Simoncelli, two good people to know. Uncle Teddy wasted no time. Early Thursday morning, a week after my Saturday evening call, Teddy knocked on our front door. He sat down opposite Jane and me. I handed him the beer and held my breath. Teddy started. Well, first, I'll tell you the good news. 
Taylor didn't do anything with Carlo Barzino. I let the air out of my chest. Jane squeezed my hand at the same time. I think it's time to intervene. There was a little flirting between them, and Carlo is a professional charmer. Legally, we couldn't wiretap Taylor's phone, but based on Carlo's contacts with some shady characters who were already under surveillance, my friends in the police obtained a court order to wiretap Carlo. He called her a couple of times this week. He pretended to ask her advice regarding his girlfriend. Taylor was friendly on the phone and tried to give him advice on navigating his relationship, which, by the way, doesn't exist, but Taylor didn't accept any of his offers to meet outside of work. Oh, see, so, here's the bad news. The Russian mafia tried to find out something from Paul, but could not find any dirty laundry on him, so they are trying to come in from the other side. Apparently, the Russians found out that Paul's mother Claire had become a slut. They use Carlo, who has a very nasty reputation as a top-notch gigolo, to find out something about Taylor. Then they will either blackmail Paul or believe that it will turn Paul into an imbecile when he finds out that his wife has turned into as big a slut as his mother. You must be joking. Do they think it will work? Well... My sources say there's an Interpol report that tells how it worked once before. There was a prosecutor in Europe who became furious when he was shown photographs of his wife having sex with several men at the same time. A man went crazy and entered a local Russian social club with a gun. He fired a couple of shots before being subdued. A couple of people were injured. No one died, but the investigation was suspended and the whole case was hushed up. I know it sounds too weird to be true, but what about the old saying about fact being stranger than fiction? Anyway, that's the story my police friends told me. The Russians seem to think they can repeat their scenario here. Fine. If this is what is happening, what should we do? First, call Taylor so she can tell you what's going on with Carlo. Secondly, get rid of Carlo because he's probably getting desperate about Paul coming home next week. So far, he has not committed any crime, so the police cannot intervene. And as a retired police officer, I cannot be involved in his disappearance, otherwise I will lose my pension, and maybe even worse. Jane, call your mother's brother Vin. It's his business. Teddy suggested Jane's Uncle Vincent deal with Carlo, which got me thinking. Uncle Ted, what if Carlo is related to the Sicilians? Sicilians and Russians working together? This won't happen, Mark. These guys hate each other. Carlo is, strictly speaking, a freelance gigolo. He should have known when the Russians hired him that he was playing with fire. If Vin makes him disappear, there will be one less piece of crap in town. Ted finished his beer, stood up, kissed his niece on the cheek, and walked out the door, saying, Good luck. Let me know when it's over. It was time to act quickly. It was Thursday, and Paul was due home the following Tuesday or Wednesday, so it seemed logical that Carlo would have to perform his play that weekend before Paul returned home. I called Vincent and asked if we could come over right away. Jane called Taylor and asked her to come over tonight. Neither Jane nor I had ever asked Uncle Vin for a favor before. I knew he loved his niece, but he and I were never really close. Did he like my son, who wasn't actually a blood relative enough to help with this problem? What about the Russians? Could Vincent's involvement have sparked some kind of gang war? The wedding day scene from The Godfather and these questions were running through my head as we sat in his office and told him what we had learned from Ted. Okay, tell Taylor to accept Carlo's offer to meet. I'm guessing he'll try to meet on Saturday night after work. He'll pour her a couple drinks, and if necessary, slip her drink with a date rape drug and then take advantage of the situation. I know this Carlo. He came to us looking for a job, and we turned him down because of his reputation. It doesn't surprise me that he was captured by the Russian mafia. Hard cases have no respect for respectable women. I had to ask, will this cause problems between you and the Russians? No. That's why they use an outsider. They think we're too stupid to connect the dots between them, Carlo, and my great-nephew. When Vincent said, Great nephew, my eyes opened wide and he noticed the expression on my face. Mark, I know we haven't discussed this. You married my niece, the sweetest girl I know. 
If I were lucky enough to have a daughter, I would pray that she would grow up to be as beautiful inside and out as Jane. I looked at Jane, and she blushed. Vincent continued, And I would pray that she would be lucky enough to find the love that Jane found with you and your son. I pay attention to these things. I know you two have something that few couples have, and I thank you for sharing that with my niece. Go home. Talk to Taylor and tell her to go out with that clown on Saturday night after work. Nothing will happen to Taylor. I guarantee it. With that, Uncle Vincent stood up, shook my hand, and kissed the top of Jane's head as he hugged her. Without a doubt, both uncles loved her as if she were their own daughter. No matter how difficult it was to ask Uncle Vincent for help, the hardest part was yet to come. Taylor was supposed to come that evening. She seemed more relaxed than last Saturday afternoon. When we opened the door, she kissed us both and sat down to dinner. I hoped this was a good sign. Jane took the initiative. Taylor, it's not easy to say this, but Mark and I were disturbed by what we saw on Saturday. Is there something going on between you and this, Carlo? Taylor reacted sharply to Jane's questions. Mom, how could you think that? Please, Taylor. I never insult your intelligence. Don't insult mine. It was quite obvious that the two of you were sharing a moment, even without any obvious physical affection, when Mark and I walked into the restaurant, and you were too excited when you realized it was us to claim complete innocence. And even if you didn't think you were having an emotional affair, it was obvious that Carlo thought you were. Taylor burst into tears when Jane finished. Sorry, Mom. Sorry, Dad. I swear nothing happened other than some mild flirting. I was embarrassed by what you saw on Saturday. I would never do anything to hurt Paul. Carlo tried to persuade me to go on a date with him, but I kept turning him down. I admit that during work hours, I allowed him to be more flirtatious than he should have been. He has a way of making it seem innocent. But please believe me when I tell you that there was never any physical intimacy between us, and I never suggested to him that we could be anything more than just friendly colleagues. Now it was my turn. Given how wound up Taylor was, I had to be careful with the next phase of this intervention. Well, hold on to your hat, young lady, because you haven't heard everything yet. I continued to tell Taylor about the Russians and what Carlo was really doing as a gigolo, about the incident in Europe and how it fit into the plot. If I hadn't talked directly to Jane's uncles, I would have found it hard to believe. So I wasn't surprised when Taylor asked if we were making this all up to scare the crap out of her. Jane, call Uncle Ted. Let Taylor hear it herself. With Uncle Ted on the line, we watched as Taylor became more and more upset as Ted confirmed what we had told her. When she hung up, I handed her a glass of brandy. Taylor took a long sip from her glass and looked a little better. <laughs> what should I do now? Should I quit? I answered her. No, but what we are about to ask of you may be very difficult. First of all, and please forgive me for asking this question, do you swear that nothing happened between you and Carlo? I'm very sorry, but everything depends on your answer. Taylor had tears in her eyes as she answered. Please believe me, Dad. I have never had anyone other than your son since the day we pledged our love to each other and became exclusive. If I were that kind of woman, I wouldn't have married Paul. I know how much it hurt him when his biological mother left you two, and I couldn't claim to love a man and do this to him. I want what you two and my parents have a lifelong partnership with your soulmate. And for me, that's Paul. Taylor, this means so much to me. With that said, if you agree, here's what we need you to do. We've hired a couple of private detectives to keep an eye on you for the next few days. We expect Carlo to ask you to meet him for a drink before Paul gets home, most likely after work on a Saturday night. Accept his invitation. At this, Taylor started shaking her head no and looking at me as if I was crazy. It's okay, Taylor. Make sure it's a very public meeting place. No apartments in other private areas. Detectives will be nearby. Before you even take your first sip, the detectives will intervene. I didn't tell Taylor that the detectives were actually connected to Uncle Vincent. If she guessed, then she was smart enough to leave everything as it was. When the detectives get involved, one of them will put you in a taxi and they will take you straight here. I also didn't tell Taylor that the taxi didn't actually have a driver. It was another one of Vincent's employees, 
we didn't want to take any risks. As expected, Carlo called Taylor on Friday and asked if she wanted to have drinks with him after work on Saturday. He came clean, saying he needed her feminine insight after being dumped. He acted as if his heart would break if he couldn't share his grief with Taylor because he liked and respected her. Being Italian, he said he needed to know why American women didn't find him worthy or attractive. Taylor tried her best to sound sympathetic and agreed to go out for drinks with him on Saturday. Taylor went to work late on Saturday, missing the first half of her shift. She told us there was no way she could handle it while working side by side with Carlo for a full 10-hour shift. At 11 p.m., Taylor's taxi pulled into her driveway. She walked through the door, sat down on the couch, and cried on Jane's shoulder. Fortunately, this ordeal is over. On Sunday afternoon, we went to Jane's parents' house for dinner. I wasn't surprised when Uncle Vin showed up. I smelled lasagna and garlic bread in the oven and saw two bottles of Sicilian red on the table. After dinner, he invited Jane and me to the back porch. When Uncle Vin enjoyed his cigar and we all drank Strega after dinner, he told us that he had taken care of everything. Looks like two of Uncle Vin's guys convinced Carlo to leave the bar after Taylor left. I'm guessing the guns and threats were part of the persuasion, since none of the other bar patrons took any notice. Carlo was found in possession of the date rape drug and ecstasy. Carlo was taken to a warehouse and sang like a bird while he was filmed. Carlo revealed everything, including where he intended to take Taylor after drugging her. Uncle Vin's two other boys went to the hotel room, where they found the three villains waiting for Carlo and Taylor. Two cameras on tripods were ready for the event. Taylor was very lucky that night. Three men at the hotel were found the next day, gagged and tied to chairs. They will all live but without the use of their fingers and toes for several months and extensive rehabilitation. Carlo will never be found. Taylor stayed with us until Paul returned home on Wednesday. It was an emotional evening. Paul was told everything except Uncle Vincent's role in Carlo's disappearance. Paul is a bailiff and some things cannot be shared. We argued that Carlo must have left town to avoid incurring the wrath of the Russians for his failure to seduce Taylor. We know Paul is smarter than to believe it, but he's also smart enough to know when not to ask questions. Taylor held her breath as she told Paul about the flirting that was going on between her and Carlo, no matter how innocent it was. The moment lightened significantly when Paul said that if every couple got divorced because of some workplace dispute, there wouldn't be many marriages left. In fact, he said, he had to admit that he and Sandra Miller, one of the other lawyers in the office, flirted with each other from time to time. We all burst out laughing when Taylor reacted to his confession. Tell that bitch to stay away from my husband. Taylor immediately blushed when she realized what she had said. Paul told his boss about the plot, and let's just say it didn't help the Russians cause one bit. It appears the Russians also tried to ambush a female lawyer working on a case in Paul's office. She put two and two together when she found out about Carlo and Taylor. A young man she had recently started dating was trying to get her involved in a local swingers club. All this was too much of a coincidence, and she immediately left the guy. The full might of the Federal Reserve and state and local law enforcement agencies was unleashed on the Russians. All of Paul's colleagues had only a vague idea of what the Russians were planning for the two of them. And if that weren't enough, I think a Sicilian friend of ours sent word that if his nephew or his nephew's wife were ever harmed, all bets were off. At our 25th anniversary party, I saw Teddy and Vincent talking in the corner. I didn't bother them, but I would really like to be involved in this conversation. Soon after, Taylor quit her job. She spent time preparing children's work and volunteering at the kindergarten. We were surprised to learn that she was carrying twins. The twins were born last month, and yes, they are definitely my son's babies. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.